Welcome to Movie Oubliette, the film review podcast for movies that most people have mercifully forgotten. I'm Dan. And I'm Conrad. And in each episode, we drag a forsaken film out of the Oubliette, discuss it and judge it to decide whether it should be set free, <laughs> or whether it should be thrown back and consigned to oblivion forever. <laughs> Welcome listeners, you're listening to Movie Oubliette, episode 98, the hemisphere encompassing podcast with me, Dan, enjoying the sweet, sweet taste of coffee again in Melbourne, Australia. Oh, and me, Conrad, wearing black in Cambridge, UK. Ah, can't go wrong with black. In this podcast, <laughs> we ponder over genre films, horror, sci-fi and fantasy because when you feel like the world is utter chaos, watching a film about monsters is somewhat comforting. Hello, Conrad. <laughs> <laughs> yes, what a strange state of affairs it is. Hello, Dan. Mm. How are you? Have, you? have you been staving off the coffee for a while and, and suddenly unleashed upon it again? Yeah, well, I, I kind of go through phases of drinking coffee. It, it, I'm not addicted to it like everyone else seems to be. I don't need it every morning. Mm. Um, but at the moment, I've been trying to do early, early starts uh, in my day. And so the cup of coffee... Cup of Joe in the morning does help the energy levels. Um, oh. But yeah, so I've been having a percolator coffee, like the, the one that you, you put on the stove and it bubbles over. Uh, they're called mockers in uh, Italy. Um, but it's, yeah, oh. delicious. Mm, does sound nice. I do love the smell of it. Mm. But I have to say, I don't drink it an awful lot myself. I'm more of a tea man. Well, you're, you are British. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> I it, it's in your blood cliche. to drink tea. <laughs> <laughs> I think my blood is just 90% tea yes. at this point. <laughs> yes. And how are you, Conrad? Oh, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, down in the dumps at the moment because, unfortunately, my... My beloved dog passed away yeah, this week. so sad. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah, it's a shame. My, We watched many a movie oubliette film together. Oh. I have to say she didn't tend to pay that much attention <laughs> or offer much in the way of criticism. Mm -hmm. Mostly snoring. But yeah. Yeah, so there's a big gap on the sofa oh. at the moment. <laughs> oh, that's sad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah dogs, are, dogs are just great. Yeah. So... Never mind. <laughs> well, uh, changing pace, uh, anything in the mailbag today, Conrad? Well, we have gained two new patrons. So Ooh. hello to Christopher and Chazilla. Hello. Uh, welcome aboard. Yes, welcome, welcome. Great to have you. And people have been commenting on Buckaroo Bonsai still when Oof. we were sharing a clip from the nightclub scene. Wicked person pointed out... That is a saxophonist playing two saxes at the same time, <laughs> isn't it? Is that a thing? <laughs> well, it's the 80s. Anything goes. Well, quite. Exactly. And Russian machines replied, in the 80s, yes. Oh, yes. Also, <laughs> the 80s are known for shirtless ripped sax players on beaches. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Is that Lost Boys? It is, yes. Yeah. Remember it well. Mm -hmm. Sort of mm -hmm. burned in my memory, actually. <laughs> Yeah, that guy had a resurgence of popularity because of memes from that scene. It's pretty amazing. He did. And, you know, I always assumed that he wasn't actually the artist singing and that he was just some random pumped guy that they found in a gym. But I think actually he is actually the artist that's uh -huh. singing that yeah. track. Yeah. Which, um, <laughs> silly me. <laughs> there we go. Switching gears to Lord Merman, our previous episode, we talked about the video game that came out, which was published in Japan under the name Virtual Wars. And uh, the video game did quite well in the West and even got a oh. sequel for the home computer market. And Beach Boy Nick, long-term listener, said, the graphics look better than the films. <laughs> <laughs> I think it translates to video games a little bit more than uh, than than film, I think, especially in the early 90s. 
Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's very much a SNES sort of uh, aesthetic, if anybody remembers their Super Nintendo system. Mm. And apparently the music, because when I was looking for the music for Lawnmower Man so that I could um, ape it for our music for the episode, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't find it, but I could find loads of people sharing the music from the video game because ah. apparently that's hugely popular, Wow! that soundtrack. Wow. So there you go. Uh -huh. And finally on Lord Merman, Surge of Cold Crash Pictures. Hello, Surge. Hello, Surge. <laughs> he says Lord Merman definitely commits to itself, and I do think it works on a basic screenwriting level, but every story beat and creative decision is just so bizarre. <laughs> Job is basically simple Jack played completely straight, hmm. that I had a very hard time getting invested and connecting. In fact, I feel like I couldn't connect is letting it off the hook too easy. My least favourite thing about it is probably the way that they turn Job into evil by having him, checks notes, kill a bunch of violent, abusive authoritarians. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is mm -hmm. true. I mm -hmm. hadn't realised that. Actually, in the theatrical cut, the only people he kills are horrid people mm. that are abusing their families or machine gunning innocent people or, yeah yeah i mean killing's still not right but it, it's, <laughs> it, it's ultimately it's not the best way to resolve a domestic abuse issue no, no no but it does point out the thing that you said about the director's cut which is that that includes job killing pierce brosnan's wife mm. in the in the movie yeah yeah so that changes the dynamic quite a lot i think yes the uh, finale yes the yes I would agree with Serge about the screenwriting being sound. Like it is, on paper, it does seem to work. And I, I think a, a remake of this movie would work under the right direction. Mm. Uh, just didn't quite pull it off at, at the time. No, I didn't think so. And of course, we said the execution was far from perfect. But the uh, quote of that that went out on our social, somebody replied, the execution was perfect. So, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> there are fans out there. Of course, so there there we go. of course. That's good. It's to their own. Yes, yes. Thanks, everyone, for getting in touch. So, Conrad, what's uh, in store for us today? Well, who knows? Let me just amble on over here to the oubliette. And, mm -hmm. uh, oh, Ooh, gosh, it's, it's like an underground city in here. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. I think I'm in the wrong tunnel. Oh, Ew. what is it, Conrad? Trodden in something. I'm sure some cream would sort that out. <laughs> oh, uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, okay, I've got the film. I'm coming back. Okay. Oh, what's below remains below. That is the law. A few extra bodies down there. We had a wonderful carnival of creatures. Mm. So odd. What do you have for us today? I have Nightbreed, the 1990 American dark fantasy horror film written and directed by Clive Barker, based on his own novella, Cabal, mm -hmm. starring Craig Sheffer and Bobby, the director David Cronenberg, Charles Hayde, Hugh Quashie, and Doug Bradley. Mm, right. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing some sort of sinful story is in store. Well, yes. I mean, it tells the story of Aaron Boone, a handsome young man who's being treated by a psychiatrist, Dr. Decker, for recurring nightmares about an underground city of monsters called Midian. Unbeknownst to Boone, Decker is a sociopathic killer <laughs> who plans to frame him for a series of family slayings. Convinced he's one of the monsters he dreams about, Boone flees to find the one place he's sure he'll be accepted – the mythical Midian, which turns out not to be so mythical after all. In right. fact, it's full of weird and wonderful creatures, and one hickey later, he becomes <laughs> one of them. Pursued by his remarkably devoted girlfriend, Laurie, his deranged doctor, the local police and their volunteer lynching mob, Boone discovers he's a prophesied chosen one doomed to bring a genocidal war raining down on the secret town of freaks he calls home. Will he be able to lead them to safety and bring the evil Dr. Decker to justice? Find out. Mm. Ooh. And we'll be joined by a guest. <laughs> we will, thank goodness. After the break? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. 
Our special guest today is the managing editor of Daily Dead, a nirvana of horror entertainment news, the author of Monsters, Makeup and Effects, and, after introducing us to Vamp, our very own queen of the After Dark Club. Please welcome Heather Wixon. Hello. Hey, hello. Thank you. That's that's like the nicest intro, the queen of the After Dark Club. Oh, yes. I'm going to get a t-shirt that says that. <laughs> you definitely yeah. deserve that title, because we have... I have not seen that movie and we had a great time discussing it with you. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you. It's it's still one that people continuously discover. Mm. Uh, in fact, somebody on my Twitter feed this week was talking about it and it was their first time watching it. And I was like, okay, I'm not going to like inundate you with a bunch of tweets, but here's a few tweets. <laughs> <laughs> so you're still going until you've converted everyone, I guess. <laughs> exactly. So how have things been for you? What have you been up to recently? Recently got to to enjoy a fun little, I guess this would be like a milestone in my career, which is strange to say 15 years in, but that I'm actually still having them. But they just announced the next issue for Fangoria, which comes out this spring. And the cover art is celebrating Ty West's new movie X, which comes out, uh, I believe, in March. Mm -hmm. And I was really honored that I got to basically share with the world that I got to write the cover story for the new issue. Oh, wow. So that was pretty cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's something like eight-year-old me would be totally freaking out about. Yeah. And much older me is freaking out about. Yes. So that was pretty amazing. <laughs> I never imagined in a million years I would get to write a cover story for Fangoria. So that was really cool. You could probably hear my dog getting all huffy in the back. Getting excited too, yeah. <laughs> he gets very excited for my work. But yeah, you know, it's funny, you know, through the pandemic, a lot of stuff slowed down, but horror really didn't. No. Mm. Horror waits for no one. Yeah. And there have been a lot of great movies recently. Is there anything you've seen a sneak peek of that we should be looking out for? Um, well, I do highly recommend X. Mm. I'm still somewhat under embargo, but what I will say is that Pretty much any horror movie coming out this year is going to have its work cut out for them topping that experience for me. Oh, wow. Um, it was just phenomenal. I've seen it twice now. I loved it the first time. The second time, it really clicked in ways I wasn't even expecting. So that is one I really recommend people keep an eye out for. I'm trying to think if there's others. Here in the States, we just had a new movie hit Hulu called Fresh. Okay. Which is a very dark horror comedy with Sebastian Stan and Daisy Edgar Jones. And that was when it premiered at Sundance a few months ago. And I think it was originally Fox Searchlight had done it. Um, and that one was a big surprise to me as well. Mm. Yeah. It's funny. Cause like, if we don't necessarily have a ton of stuff coming out theatrically, there's always stuff hitting streaming and things like that. Mm. So whenever everybody gets a little bummed out when they say like, Oh, you know, we're not getting original horror. I'm like, Oh, please. Like, <laughs> We're getting so much original horror. It just may not be going theatrical mm. or it might just be very limited theatrical in the case of something like Studio 666, which just came out with the Foo Fighters. Right. Yes. So, <laughs> yeah. So it's always busy. There's always something. Yeah, which is a good problem to have. <laughs> it is, yes. Dan and I still have these dreams that when we're retired, we'll just be sat in an armchair just catching up on all the things that we missed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the dream. Yeah. <laughs> so today we are casting our eyes back some 30 years to Clive Barker's second movie, Nightbreed, but well, certainly as director, I think uh, Hellraiser 2 had already come out at this point, which he didn't helm. Mm. Heather, you picked this movie for us. Could you start us off by talking about your history with this movie, how you first came across it, and maybe some of the production history behind it? Because it's a complicated tale. It is. So I, as a kid who was fortunate enough to sort of have you know, the ability to kind of watch whatever. I remember renting Nightbreed, probably I would, I want to say like in 91. So I was like in middle school and it was funny because I didn't watch the Hellraiser movies till I was in like junior high, which probably was better because those are pretty intense movies to watch if you're much younger <laughs> yeah. than that. Oh, yeah. uh, they're still pretty intense when you're in junior high as well. But I saw the name Clive Barker and I remember my reactions to Hellraiser and even Hellraiser 2, which Tony Randall, I know, did. And I just remember thinking like, wow, you know, there was so much interesting world building that happened in those movies. And I was like, I'm really curious what this is. And for me, 
I think the biggest thing that stood out was the way that they present the monsters in this movie, because typically when you're watching horror movies, like the monsters are usually the villains or they're sort of the misunderstood anti-heroes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I just thought the way that they were able to go into the world of these monsters was just really fascinating, even if the version that we got all those years ago really wasn't the vision that Clive had had Mm -hmm. for the story. But I knew there was something there and I knew there was something that just really spoke to me. And also I have to admit, because I was somebody who grew up completely loving the movie, uh, some kind of wonderful, you know, I was like, Oh, Craig Shefford, you know, Hardy Jens with two ends, as they say in that movie, uh, (laughs) is it a horror movie? Like, of course I'm going to watch this. And I think he's phenomenal. Um, I think everybody in this movie is really fantastic. And I think now that we have the director's cut and we have this sort of fully realized version, or at least as close to what Clive wanted to do with this movie as he could, because they did sort of hit some production issues throughout shooting and things like that. To me, it feels like a real gift. Like it's one of those Moby Dick or Holy Grail kind of things. Um, And I think for a lot of horror fans, getting this version of Nightbreed out and for it to look as great as it does, where it's not just like work print versions. Cause I know there was the Cabal cut that came out years ago. And that was just sort of like mishmash of VHS rips of copies of scenes and things like that. And it was interesting, but it's not visually pleasing. It's a little bit of a hard watch actually. Mm. So to have this fully realized version after all these years really is a gift. And it made me love the movie even more. I, you know, you can really see the full arc of what he was trying to do with these characters and with this world building And it somehow even made David Cronenberg even creepier as Dr. Decker. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. So, but yeah, it's a movie that I know, you know, when they first set out to make it, Clive went to partner it up with Morgan Creek. And unfortunately, some producers there got a little too (laughs) producery, I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah. And decided that the movie needed more slasher elements, which is so strange to me. Um, in a movie that's very much a dark fantasy about monsters. So you have like these sequences that just, they're fine now and I actually enjoy them, but they don't feel like they fit in with the rest of the movie, particularly like at the hotel and the, even the opening sequence when Dr. Decker, you know, attacks that family, including that young boy who's crying. Yeah. Um, because I think even some of the insert shots at the hotel, I, you know, Clive didn't direct. Uh, wow. And I know that from interviewing Tony Gardner, who did some of the effects on those sequences in particular. Um, Bob Keen is the one who handled all the primary effects, but I know Tony Gardner was brought in for some of the slasher type ones. In fact, it's Tony's head that you see in the hotel that's supposedly severed on the counter there after she drops her donut. Yeah, the mysterious Alvin. Yeah, who you never (laughs) see before that scene, and then all of a sudden there's his head. Mm. (laughs) Yeah, that's a weird scene. (laughs) It is, it is. You know, again, it's one of those, I think, now that we have the director's cut and everything else feels somewhere fleshed out, like, it doesn't bother me as much. But, like, Mm. you know, if you watch the original version, like, there's a lot that just feels very jarring about how that movie was put together. And it was tough for Clive, I know. In fact, I think... I think he even got sick for a few weeks during production on that just because it was look at the world that he builds there in Midian. Mm. You know, that's phenomenal stuff. So we could spend three hours just talking about all that stuff alone, <laughs> but there's so much other good stuff to dig into. But I think for me, that's why I've always been so fascinated by it mm. is because knowing what the movie has gone through to get to fans the right way after all these years, plus just like the things that Clyde was able to do and the story that he was able to tell and creating this story that was, you know, essentially making us root for the monsters and making us understand that these people who are being persecuted for all the wrong reasons, just how great and heroic they really are. Yeah. That was such a long answer. My goodness. <laughs> Dan, is this something that you'd seen at the time or is this entirely new to you? I have seen it previously, but only in the last 10 years. It's not something I watched back when it came out. And it's in 1990 it came out. Mm. I would have been seven. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, that would have been <laughs> nightmare material for me. But, yeah, I went through a few years ago, I went through quite a big Clive Barker phase where mm. I was just seeking out 
anything and everything Clive Barker because, I mean, he's done some great stuff. Hellraiser, and then um, he wrote Candyman and Lord of Illusions and Midnight Meat Train. I even saw Book of Blood that came out in 2009 that no one seems to talk about. So, yeah, I kind of went through a Barker phase and this definitely crossed my path. I do agree with Heather. It is quite jarring, the kind of two movies that it is, like the slasher and then the entirely different world building of the monster world of Midian. And it does seem quite jarring, especially in that first scene with Decker killing the family. I was like, who's this family? And all the scenes with him killing people, we were introduced to characters we'd never seen before, and then he just kills them immediately yeah so it's it is quite jarring isn't it it is yeah but it's kudos for managing to swing this stellar piece of stunt casting to have david cronenberg one of the greatest directors in this genre as your serial killer <laughs> yeah, i don't think i've ever seen him as such a main character in a movie before as an actor no it was certainly for me i think the first time i really re- like because i knew You know, I obviously knew who he was as a director, and I remember seeing him pop up in the fly and things like that. But this was one of those movies where I was like, oh, my God, like, this man is terrifying. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. It almost made his movies even scarier in retrospect somehow. But so charming. And he's a fox as well. I mean, I didn't realize what a silver (laughs) fox Cronenberg was in 1990. He just fits the suave, yuppie look that he's got going on. And he's so cool and calm and he underplays everything until he reaches a sort of breaking point. He's really chilling as Philip K. Decker, which is a reference to Philip K. Dick, I believe. Yep. The psychiatrist turned serial killer with the button eye mask, which is terrifying. I think it's one of the most terrifying things Clive Barker's ever come up with visually. Yeah. I don't know how he sees out of it, though. Yeah. There, there's some functionality questions I have about that mask. <laughs> yeah. But it looks awesome. <laughs> yeah, it does. I think what's terrifying about Decker as well is how controlled he is. Like, he's quite soft-spoken as well. Mm. He's not maniacal in how he acts. Mm. That's terrifying. Yeah. yeah, he's quietly manipulative, which makes me Probably as a teenager, I was just like, well, that makes me really nervous about like people working in psychiatry and stuff. Like there's this just like this underlying, like, are they manipulating you the whole time to like get you to get to these places? And like, it's even like you see him like in the scene in the hospital, he doesn't come into that scene uh, with Hugh Ross as Narcisse seeming like he's there to do a bad thing but we know he is Mm. there's such an understated way that he plays that character as you mentioned until there's that shift where all of a sudden he's like now he's in hyperdrive and then he's even more terrifying Mm. for sure i was confused by his motives though like what was he trying to achieve with boone like was he trying to frame him i feel like he understood that somehow because of probably sessions that he had with boone and boone obviously having this connection to midian i'm guessing dr decker had a fascination with this underworld place sure. and that he probably thought not realizing that the people who end up there you know they're not like him you know they're not murderers and things like that that he thought he could get in there and maybe harness the sort of power that comes from being a part of the community in Midian and then realizing like, Oh wait, whoops, (laughs) maybe I'm not necessarily going to fit into what, they're all about there, especially once we get to sort of the big climax of like basically the whole big war breaking out and things like that. But I'm guessing he's just a guy who's very much into some really dark things and just thought like this was another way to sort of take his fascinations to another level and maybe also sort of gain some power from that too. Mm, Yeah. Okay. Because you are dropped into this movie sort of halfway through almost you're dropped into established relationships Decker's nefarious plan to frame Boone is already underway. On the one hand, it doesn't treat its audience as stupid. It doesn't spoon feed you. But it does feel as though you're not given quite enough in terms of motivation and backstory, certainly in the theatrical cut, that you might want to make it a satisfying story with satisfying arcs. A lot of it is left to interpretation, I think. Mm. Yeah, I would agree. And I, as somebody who's... You know, unfortunately, I read some Clive Barker, but I'm not as well versed as a lot of folks. I don't know if maybe there's other things in his works that expanded what this idea was and maybe just not having the time or just, again, it might have been a producer's thing where they're like, well, we want to tell this part of the story. 
But it does feel like there's this whole world. In fact, I kind of wish, you know, if I had a time machine and like endless resources, I would go back in time and give Clive like $5 million and say, go make the story that's obviously takes place before this one, because there is one there. Right. But I do think yeah. if nothing else, at least the director's cut gives us a better sense of Aaron and Lori's relationship a lot more. Okay. Because that feels very cut short in the theatrical version, which is a bummer because I love Ann Bobby. And you have to wonder, like, why would this woman go to such great lengths? Like, yeah, Craig Sheffer's awesome. And that's her boyfriend and everything like that. But like, what's really driving her? Because like, you know, she goes into some pretty uncharted territory for her even. Mm. I get love is love, but like, <laughs> you know, now you're like in this monster world. You're dealing with the serial killers coming after you, you know, maybe go home. Yeah. <laughs> get out for a few weeks, <laughs> come back and check in and see how everybody's doing. Yeah. But not Lori. Um, yeah. So I like that we get a little bit better of a sense of what drives her their relationship and just how deep it really was because the theatrical doesn't really give you that yeah so this movie is based on the book cabal mm -hmm. by um clive barker which i actually own yes me too but i've never actually read it's been sitting on my shelf for years oh uh listeners won't know that i actually am holding up a book so i'm just gonna flip some papers i see it it looks wonderful <laughs> <laughs> um, i have the movie tie in edition oh. oh now i'm jealous yeah so i read this at the time and this was from the period when I was just before I was a teenager and it's like you couldn't rent an 18 movie but you could read this book and this book is strong oh yes both in terms of violence and uh, yeah there are some intimate scenes that don't happen in the movie yeah they are quite graphic I would like to ask how different is it to the movie because obviously I haven't read it uh it, the overall arc of the story is the same there is a lot more detail there is a lot more lore around Midian and all of the creatures in it some of the characters that are in the movie are not in the book oh okay so True. sassy for example oh wow yeah she came along later uh ralph Macquarie, the great conceptual artist who's responsible for so much of star wars oh, right. he sat down with clive during pre-production and one of the characters that they painted was shuna sassy she like is kind of almost one of like the fan favorites too yeah like especially like i remember like in the 2000s like whenever you could find like nightbreed t-shirts and things like that she's always on there i mean because she's so stunning that makeup and everything about her performance is fantastic so that's interesting to me is she the yeah. porcupine girl yeah, yeah she's the one with the quills oh yeah. yeah oh the makeup and effects on her were astounding like faultless but yeah the makeup and effects on this movie is just quite astonishing like so many monsters yeah, yeah. that was basically the work of bob keen uh who had also worked on the first two hellraiser movies as well mm. Yeah, I could see similarities. Yeah, and he was a guy who came out of the UK as well. I remember talking to him and just the amount of work that they had to do every single day. I think they slept like two to three hours a night because it was just like they would get everybody out of makeup, sleep for like three hours. And by the time it was like it was time to start rotating people in for makeup and things like that. So it was yeah. it was a huge undertaking for his entire team over there. Yeah, yeah. to the point where you would watch the movie and, and some characters seem to only appear once. Mm. Like, wow, that's a lot of time and effort for two seconds of screen time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the thing, again, also like as a kid, just seeing a movie that celebrates monsters like that. Because mm -hmm. like when you grow up with like the Universal movies, which are movies I watched, you know, as a kid, like you get a Frankenstein or a bride of Frankenstein or Dracula and maybe a couple brides. But like to have a movie that is so chock full of monsters, almost to the point where there's more people in makeup than not in makeup. Yeah. To me just is like so mind blowing because people wouldn't do that today. Or if they did, they would rely a lot more on like some digital augmentation and things like that, mm. um, which they didn't have. Yeah. They weren't able to really rely on that back then. Yeah. Another amazing piece of character design is Midian's deity figure, I guess, Baphomet. Oh, Baphomet was amazing. Yeah. It's like a sculpture. It's pretty yeah. impressive stuff. Like a Christ-like figure, but like kind of dissected with like glowing bits and mm. green eyes. Oh, it's amazing. Yes. And black, mm. which leads me on to sort of one of the underlying themes of the movie, 
uh, as you say, Heather, this is very much a story where the monsters are the heroes, the downtrodden heroes. And I think it's fairly clear, coming from Clive Barker, a gay man, that the film has a strong subtext. There's even hints towards indigenous peoples being wiped out. Uh, when Rachel tells their history, she says, we're the last survivors, the tribes of the moon. We're the leftovers of all the races that your race has wiped out. So there are a lot of underlying themes here about minorities just wanting to live in peace in their in their way and just be left alone, but always being persecuted, which is not a bad theme and quite uh, advanced for 1990, I guess. Yeah, definitely. Mm. There's the scene when the monster goes out, when uh, the one who carries the dog. Oh, um, Onaka? Onaka, that's what it was. Um, Simon Bamford, how could I forget that, that was him? <laughs> and I talked to Simon about this, and there was the scene, you know, when he goes out into the daylight and he gets stopped by the police who are there, and he begins to sort of burn in the sunlight and everything like that. He said that one of the inspirations behind that scene was actually the callous horrors of the Holocaust. Oh, wow. You know, because the, how they would burn people alive there and almost delight in it. And that was something that he and Clive had talked about. Mm. So, you know, it was as much as Clive was making, you know, a really fantastical movie about monsters. Like he was trying to deal with some pretty heavy underlying themes at the same time, which when you think about where horror was in 1990, nobody was really doing that. No. And in fact, you didn't really see it again until like 92 when Candyman came out. Mm. The 80s was sort of the fun decade. And this was kind of like a response to it mm. in a way where it was like, okay, well, we've had some fun, but like we can use horror to talk about some real life atrocities and try to get people to sort of understand these things a little deeper. But yeah, I remember talking about that and just being absolutely gutted, especially when you go back and now you watch that scene and you're like, oh, dear God, like it's even more horrifying. Yeah, yeah. it's heart wrenching as it is. It is. I mean, certainly Onaka, I think, is coded as gay, scampering along with his little dog in his hands all yeah. the time. I don't think it's too much of a stretch. And I think Narcisse refers to him as a sailor at one point and tweaks one of his nipple piercings. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's definitely touching on those issues. Yeah, yeah. I was almost disappointed pointed with that police character um played by a Hugh Corshi. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Oh, the detective, yeah. Yes, yeah, the black guy. Um I was disappointed in that scene, how he kind of steps back. But I guess does that have subtext there? I mean I think maybe in some ways it does. If you look at like a movie like Boys in the Hood, you have young black men basically being harassed constantly by a black officer in that movie. Right, right. You know, so maybe there was a little bit of that in there where unfortunately for some black figures of authority, the only way to sort of fit in was to like ignore the issues that were plaguing society in a way. Right. I don't know specifically, but I it wouldn't surprise me if that's what Clive was kind of going for with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really like that character, actually. And I was really sad when he got killed mm -hmm. by Decker in that scene. It seemed so short-lived. I felt like he could have been more of a, a part in the end scene. Yeah. I was trying to remember where else I'd seen that actor. And of course, he's Captain Panaka in episode one of Star Wars. Oh, oh my right. gosh, yeah, yeah, he yeah. is. Yeah, I hadn't made the connection. He's also in Highlander. Oh. As one of the other immortals, I think. Right. Yeah. yeah. I did not make that <laughs> connection. It's funny, I because I had just recently, as of last year, I finally caught up with The Church from Michel Suave. Okay. Oh, yeah. I haven't seen that. It was one that just kind of had been on my list for a long time, and I was going to talk about it on a podcast. And I was like, oh, that guy looks really familiar. And I looked him up like, oh, it's the guy from Nightbreed. So, and I totally missed the Phantom Menace part of it. So, <laughs> yeah, his character is surprising. Less surprising, perhaps Captain Eigerman. <laughs> that guy is just jonesing to be a villain. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. I mean, he boosts his ranks with rednecks with their pitchforks and their torches that are just eager to kill some freaks who have come to the wrong town or whatever. And at one point, Eigerman even says faggot to Ashbury. Yeah. In the director's cut, Ashbury kills Eigerman, not so in the theatrical. I think in the theatrical, I checked again, I think his fate is just left to the imagination. Mm. Yeah. I don't think you see anything happen to him. So I think the redneck lynching mob is a bit disappointing in terms of a cliche. Yeah. yeah. Bit of a shortcut. 
I don't know. As somebody who comes from a redneck family, though, like it doesn't surprise me. Right. No. <laughs> if that makes sense. <laughs> like, because my whole family is like from West Virginia. I'm just like, yeah, this is probably how they react, though. Right. You know, and I mean, it's like, I don't know. Look at where we've been in the last few years. Is it so surprising? Is it so stereotypical? I don't know, really. Yeah. So, everybody listening, you can point your hate mail towards me on Twitter. I'm at the horror chick. Tell me, tell me how I disparage the rednecks, but as somebody who comes from a family of rednecks, I don't know that I find it that far off, to be honest, unfortunately. Okay. We, you can say I wouldn't dare. <laughs> Well, uh, talking about other characters, I really liked the character of, is it Narcisse? Yeah, mm. from uh, Hugh Ross, right? Yeah. A really interesting character that's as uh, sort of introduces this crazy man that wants to get to Midian and then he, he starts just cutting his skin off, off his face, which is mm. probably the most gory scene in the movie. But yeah, his character throughout the film kind of did remind me a bit of the character from um, American Werewolf in London, the dead friend that is just always there. Oh, yeah, Griffin Dunn. Like kind of similar, sort of sarcastic and like um, a little bit sadistic. But yeah, talking about the differences between the director and the theatrical cuts, uh, he's killed off. In the director's cut, mm. I was so sad about that. And and kind of off screen as well, you don't see it happen. Yeah, that is a bit of a bummer because uh, I think Hugh Ross adds a lot to it. Because like, he's almost sort of like the comic relief yeah. for a lot of the movie because it's like they're throwing a lot of serious stuff at you throughout this movie. And he's sort of this jovial, fun-loving kind of guy. Mm. When we first meet him in the hospital, he's so downtrodden he's almost beside himself yeah you can tell that there's something extremely wrong with him but once he gets to midian he's full of joy mm. like he's happy mm. it's like two very different performances all wrapped into one and he adds a lot like him and, and craig shefford together are really fun because mm. i love craig shefford but he's not a super funny guy He's very brooding. Yeah. I mean, obviously, because he's got a lot going on in this movie. But I, it's a really nice balance, I think, to a lot of the heaviness that comes from this story and this world and the things that these characters are going through. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that scene when he cuts his face with the two little uh, silver appendages that he puts on his hands like oh on his gosh. thumbs yeah. <laughs> the, yeah the thumb blades <laughs> Ooh, that's some trauma right there he is a great bit of comic relief i love him in scenes like the really heavy scene where boone is being initiated in midian and it's very serious and noble and danny elfman's score is giving it all the the weight and the mysticism that it needs and then narcisse interrupts it because he's lighting a fag in the corner <laughs> yeah like a cigarette yeah <laughs> just has to silently mouth Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love his quip. Sometimes he reminds me of Jack Nicholson playing the Joker almost. Oh, yeah. Like the scene where I think they burst into a police station and uh, he makes one of them sort of run away in fear and he says, I do love a coward or something and cackles to himself. And I thought, oh, ah, yeah, I'm getting hints of Jack Nicholson here. Mm. It's funny. I actually think they might have been shooting at Pinewood at the same time as Batman for a little bit. Yes, oh. don't they tell a story of trying to break into the set at one point? Yeah, I really off. I really think that they were there around the same time. Yeah. Because, I mean, Batman was at the studio for, I think, a year and a half, mm. I want to say. Wow. I, I would love to see uh, Narcisse driving around in, like, the Batmobile or something, just having, having a fun time of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now it's time for Random Trivia. Okay, it's trivia time. Normally I do trivia, but Conrad, I believe you've got something that you've brought out of the uh, bowl of immortal juice. Uh, Conrad, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, so Pelequin, the actor who plays him, Oliver Parker, uh, so memorably, turns out that he is a director in and of his own right now and directs lots of terribly British films like The Importance of Being Earnest, uh, Dorian Gray, Johnny English Reborn, Dad's Army, Swimming with Men. So he's, yeah, he's become quite the director of British comedies. So oh, wow. Who knew? <laughs> he's, so, he's so menacing in this movie. Though. I know, he's so good as Pelequin, but uh, yeah, he's, he's, he's uh, settled into comedy of manners type of movies, right. which is quite sweet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's our trivia. Okay.
that's the link between this movie and Batman. Danny Elfman did the score for both of them. I did find this the score for this movie did sound quite Batman-esque. Lots of brass and bombastic percussion. Very large and in life. Adds a lot to this movie. Yeah, here stateside, you know, we kind of knew of Elfman coming off of like Oingo Boingo and things like that. Mm -hmm. But this was still pretty early, like in his career in terms of becoming who he is now. Right. Now in these days, like you can listen to like a few notes and you're like, oh, that is a Elfman score. Oh, yeah. Where, you know, he was still kind of finding his groove back then. And I actually kind of like it. I tend to enjoy more of his earlier works, I think, than his later works, because I think there's a lot of similarities that kind of come from his later works, especially all the stuff he does with Tim Burton. Mm. I think there's, you know, I don't say this in a, in a bad way because it's all enjoyable, but there's sort of almost a sameness where at least it feels back then he was kind of like trying to do something a little different. Um, but there is like, you could play parts of this and you'd almost think it was Batman 89 mm. in certain spots. Yeah. yeah. I think he used a lot of um, like melodic motifs a lot more back then. So it was always instantly recognizable, especially in Batman, obviously with that. <laughs> it's, it's just like so hummable. And in this movie, the, the same sort of musical techniques used. Yeah. He said that he was trying to use, quote, children's voices and a whole slew of ethnic drums and instruments together with an orchestra in an attempt to bring a unique musical tone to the film. Mm. Yeah, I was going to say also, too, because with the drums and stuff, which I think is really interesting because you have certain sequences like when Anne Bobby's character is like going through Midian and she's kind of encountering all these different creatures and you have some of them like beating against the walls and stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just such a really great marriage of the visual in the the sonic again it sort of like heightens the experience of being in that world you know thinking about it now like in looking at like what was going on in horror at this point it's just such a beautiful marriage that scores are always great you need them obviously they're an integral part of any film mm. but i just love the way that they really complement each other here in some very unexpected ways where it feels really organic mm. It's very Elfman, though. Yeah. I mean, you listen to a few bars of it and you think, yeah, that's Elfman. Yeah. I think he's playing Coachella this year, which I think is interesting. Wow. wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's funny, like years and years ago, we went to Coachella. I forget what year it was, but Hans Zimmer played. Oh, yeah. Which is like something you wouldn't expect at like Coachella. But I will tell you, and it's funny because I'm older, but like when the Lion King theme hits, <laughs> yeah. kids went crazy uh, like yeah. it was like if taylor swift showed up at like some teen girl gala or something it was like <laughs> people lost their minds to the lion king and i was like because i was older when that came out so it's fine but it was like the way that these like 20 somethings and early 30 somethings went bananas so i think like <laughs> danny elfman at coachella is kind of interesting where i'm like I think I'd go to that. I would. <laughs> Look, for I think sure. it'd be kind of fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was lucky enough to see Danny's first ever live concert at the Albert Hall with Tim Burton and Helena Bonham Carter. Oh, mm. wow. wow. That was an amazing night. Wow. And yeah, the weird thing with that was I, he was like right there. I had really good seats. I was about five feet away from him. But to see him singing, what's this, live in front of me <laughs> and behind they had the big screen with the film on and I just kept looking at the film and thinking, gosh, he's matching the lips really well. And then I thought, Danny Elfman is right there. Watch him. You can watch the movie anytime. What are you doing? <laughs> but yeah, that was a great experience. And he was really moved because he'd never done a live performance of his film scores before. And the reaction that he got in London was huge. Everybody went crazy oh. for things like Edward Scissorhands and so on. I am super jealous now, by the way, that you get to experience that. That's really awesome. Yeah. Oh, I miss live shows. I'm desperate for yeah. live shows to start again. I really am. Yeah, I feel you. We went, we've had some like festivals out here that are kind of like outdoor and stuff. So we've been to one because there was like one in uh, October for Halloween weekend, uh, which was nice, but it was still kind of like a little overwhelming and, you know, uh, still staying masked, trying to stay away from everybody. Yeah. But yeah, I'm right there with you. I miss that. Mm. I miss that feeling. Mm. For sure. Going back to, 
differences between the director and the theatrical cuts. Mm. The end is very different. Yes. Yeah. Which did you prefer, Heather? Um, I prefer the director because I think, again, it strengthens the relationship between Laurie and Aaron mm -hmm. because it's like this whole war has happened, you know, all of this carnage. And essentially now the Nightbreed have to like go find a new place. And I think her desire to still want to be a part of his world, for me, like seeing her sacrifice, seeing him transform her and them sort of becoming sort of this Nightbreed couple together, mm. I think just strengthens the love story sure. um, in ways that we didn't see otherwise. So I think for me, I do, I do prefer the director's cut. Mm, yeah. okay. um, I will say I do know like in the Cabal cut, there was a scene where Decker comes back. And I don't think we get that in the director's cut. No, we don't. And it's yeah. a shame because even if it was studio imposed and shot afterwards, that last shot of Decker being rejuvenated by Ashbury mm. and screaming arms outstretched at the camera as it flies away and Danny Elfman's score roars on the soundtrack until it crashes to black. It might be cheesy, it might be a little bit more obvious, but it resonated with me. I thought it was amazing. And because I loved Cronenberg's character so much, I quite liked the tease that he would be back again. Yeah, because, I mean, that makes you think like, oh, we're going to get more mm. from this world, right? Mm. Yeah. And it kind of makes you sad that we never got it. Yeah, mm. I would say I kind of preferred the theatrical cut ending. Mm. I felt like there was more closure with Boone saying goodbye to the Nightbreed and also... Narcisse doesn't die and there's that sort of nice um, goodbye with his character and then the last big horror sting with Decker coming back to life. I thought that worked. I do kind of agree that there needed to be more love story shown on screen with Laurie and Boone, but maybe that could have come early in the film. Having it so late, pretty much the final scene of the movie, it felt a bit like, why is this here? Like, it needed to come earlier for me. Yeah, there's a lot of footage missing from earlier on in the movie as well, I think. There's a lot more in terms of their relationship that even in the director's cut, I don't think you get all of it. Right, right. Yeah. It still feels a little bit compromised to me, the director's cut. I know it's closer to what Clive Barker intended, and he was so thrilled and moved to finally see it 25 years later when it was released. But it still feels clunky. Mm. Rachel's voice changes from one scene to another, for example. Sometimes she has sort of an Eastern European accent and sometimes she doesn't. Yeah, that's another thing, right? Uh, in the theatrical cut, a bunch of the actors were dubbed over. Yeah. Lylesberg, yeah. the sort of leader played by the great Doug Bradley. Mm. Uh, people may know him as Pinhead from uh, all the Hellraiser movies. Yeah, he's dubbed over. What was sort of your impression of that? Well, it's insanity. Isn't it's, it? <laughs> I'm not a fan, to be honest. It's like, how do you put Doug Bradley into a movie and then decide to dub over him? Yeah. You know, I could understand because, you know, I've seen how producers can meddle and what that causes. But it's like, clearly with the success of Hellraiser, having a British actor delivering lines, it didn't make the movie any less successful. So I don't understand why they thought like, well, let's kind of un europeanize this movie as much as possible <laughs> in a way like it doesn't make any sense because you just have such great performances and again with a character like lylesburg who is sort of this authority figure and he has a gravitas like mm. to remove doug bradley from that like you know if you've seen any of the hellraiser movies that don't have doug bradley as pinhead yeah it doesn't work yeah. it doesn't work you can see why you need doug bradley so to to make decisions like that is is very very strange to me mm. but again i think maybe hindsight's 2020 in this case and at least thankfully at some point morgan creek realized like oh whoever was in charge back then made some incorrect decisions and maybe we need to do a little course correction after all these years yeah. It's funny you saying about trying to disguise the Britishness of a film that's being released in America. I mean, Hellraiser has that sort of mid-Atlantic feel to it where is it in London or is it in America? It's not quite clear. <laughs> One of the things I noticed when Decker, that family that he attacks, when the mum opens the freezer, I was looking at the contents and there was something in there that was a cheese and onion flan. 
<laughs> and I thought, is that an American thing? Flans? It feels very British. Do you even know what a flan is? <laughs> we do, but I don't think we eat them very regularly, to be very honest. <laughs> no. in, or at least they don't exist in our freezers usually here. No. Um, I mean, maybe no. back then they did. I don't remember, but I, I know we never had any at our house. So, yeah. Cheese and onion flan. I just thought, how British is that? <laughs> Coming to you live from the Movie Oubliette Theatre, it's the prestigious Moobly Awards. Okay, it's the Moobly Awards. It's where we present our favourite hidden monster world parts of the film in a series of face-ripping-off categories. Best quote. It's a quote that I love so much. I actually have a T-shirt that says this. Oh. Um, oh, wow. And it's basically the a Pelican's quote of everything is true, God's an astronaut, Oz is over the oh. rainbow, and Midian is where the monsters live. Um, I love that To quote. me... You know, you see like the picture of like Bong Joon-ho where he's like, ah, that's cinema. To me, that is cinema. Um, yeah. It's just, it's <laughs> yeah. such a mind blowing moment where it's this very confrontational moment of like these things that, you know, in, in Boone's mind, like he always thought was like this fantasy, but it really is this reality. And it's challenging everything that we think we know about life in general in a way mm. as well. Um, mm. And I love it. Yeah, I have a t-shirt that I've had for like 15 years now, and that was the quote on it. And as soon as I saw it, I was like, it's not even the best design t-shirt or anything, but I saw that quote. And I was like, I need this. Uh, yeah. So that would be my pick. Yeah, that was my pick as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. As an honorable mention, I quite like Narcissus' line where he's pulling his face off and he says, I'm an actor, see? There's a face <laughs> beneath this face. Yeah, I love it as well. After after he pulls it off, he's just holding like bundles of hair and skin and going, oh. huh? <laughs> <laughs> Best hair or costume? I think goes to David Cronenberg in this movie for me. Yeah, I would <laughs> like, agree. I would agree. <laughs> like he just comes in and he's like, he owns that mask. He's he owns that sort of suave doctor look. You know, it's it's fantastic. Although I will say, um, Narcisse in the sequence when they're breaking Boone out of the the jail, uh, and he comes in with his cowboy hat. Oh yeah, and the sunglasses. It feels so <laughs> yeah. fun and like very very like a culture clash of like eighties and nineties like cowboyism, like American cowboyism kind of stuff. Like, um, but yeah, I mean, who you can't go wrong with. Cronenberg at all of that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, for those that need a reminder, so the mask is like, is it like leather or sort of like some sort of sack material? And it's got two black buttons for eyes and then like a lopsided slanted zipper mouth. Mm -hmm. Very, very it's, scary. It's supposed to look like sa uh, like a sack material, but it, when he pulls it off, you can definitely see that it's very much some sort of pleather or something mm. of that like texture yeah yeah so yeah the the yeah. button eyes are the, the scariest part of it i reckon and and i guess the mouth as well the zipper mouth yeah it's a great outfit most, most 90s, 90s moment for me it's almost like you know how sometimes when you go back and you watch horror movies from the 80 like from 1980 and they almost feel like this sort of like remnant of the 70s mm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, for me, it's like, this is one of these interesting movies where I don't know that it particularly feels super 90s yet mm. because I know it was made like in 89 and things like that. I'm trying to think if like, you know, honestly, if there was, a, if there was anything, it would be the production design of Dr. Decker's office. Yes. Feels very yeah. 90s. Yeah. yeah. The bubbling yeah. sort of uh, waterworks on his wall in that one oh. scene. When he has all the knives yeah. pointed, like, yeah. does he think nobody's gonna walk into his office? Does nobody <laughs> like else work in this building? Yeah. Like, it's it's very presumptuous on his part. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think it's the production <laughs> design in his office. I think for me is the most '90s aspect of this movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought the most '90s thing about this, I possibly something it was pointing towards, which was the sympathetic monsters, the downtrodden monsters, because I was thinking of, well, a lot of. Um, Tim Burton actually but it's particularly Edward Scissorhands I guess in 1990 right. you have Dark Man from Sam Raimi in 1990 
You have the Adams Family in 91, even maybe the Iron Giant, 99, oh, yes. where the robot is being treated as a monster, but actually it's misunderstood. And something like Terminator 2 in 91, where the Terminator becomes a sympathetic, heroic character, and it's actually the humans that are the problem mm. creating World War Three. Yeah. Yeah, it, it feels like the 90s were a period where we were re-examining stereotypical depictions of monsters and discovering that it's really the humans that are the problem. Mm. <laughs> so true. Mm. Favourite scene! It's so tough for me because I feel like the whole sequence of like the battle to me because it's so ambitious there's so many moving parts mm. there's explosions and there's fighting and there's mm. crazy stunt work happening and you're kind of going through all of these brilliant sets and things like that whether it's inside you know in the underground or if it's outside like amongst the the cemetery and things like that but if i think about like a singular like moment and i think for me it was the moment that like scarred me as a kid um i think it's when narcisse cuts his face right in the hospital like because <laughs> yeah, to me yeah. that was like when we went from like <laughs> oh okay and then you're like oh my god what is happening mm. yeah yeah because I, I i do feel like for the most part the gore effects in this movie are a little tame so mm. seeing that scene with with narcisse in the, in the hospital was just like wow i didn't expect that yeah yeah it comes out of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, favorite scene, Conrad? For me, every scene that David Cronenberg is in, which I know is uh -huh. the wrong instinct. <laughs> it's it's the thing that the executives loved and thought, hey, we're getting a slasher movie from Clive Barker, the guy who did Hellraiser. Let's focus on that and cut everything else out. So I know I'm I'm sort of going against the Occupy Midian crowd, but... I do love every scene Cronenberg is in and the finale of the theatrical cut. But my absolute favourite moment of his is when he accosts Laurie outside Midian in his button face mask and says, Laurie, and she says, how do you know my name? And he says, oh, that's a good question, and puts his finger in his zipper mouth yeah. and then pulls his mask off from the mouth. Yeah. And it's so sort of creepy, but sort of playful and sexy as well. It's it's a weird moment, and it's just wonderful. Mm. I love it. It's mm. so Cronenberg. <laughs> it is. It's so Cronenberg. <laughs> Most cliche horror moment. Mine was one specific moment, and it's with Curtis, or, yes, Dr. Decker. And it's uh, the killer is behind the freezer door. <laughs> Which, mm. yeah, <laughs> it's either that or bathroom cabinets, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't open anything. <laughs> no, yes, I was trying to mention to Dan that without spoiling anything, that uh, in the new screen movie, there is quite a, a long scene where somebody opens lots of doors. It's, it's a great sequence. Oh, yes. I <laughs> Every haven't... single time. Uh, yes, I'm looking forward to watching that movie. <laughs> yeah. There's also a pretty fun sequence involving basements as well. Yes. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's some good stuff in there. <laughs> yeah. Best special effect. Gosh, how do you even choose in a movie like this? Yes. Like it's that's tough, isn't that's it? just a mean question. Because <laughs> mm. <laughs> it's like it's all amazing. Like I look at all of these characters and there's just something to love. Even like the transformation of Boone, like with the symbols in his face are just so incredible. Like I you know, Lylesburg having these little ridges of eyes in his face, mm. you know, Narcisse and just the way that like his makeup looks is just so striking you know we talked a little bit about shinasasi who's like you know got these amazing quills mm. and then you of course you have baphomet like even that is incredible like i i can't pick a, spe a, a special effect i just think bob keen and his team like created something so extraordinary here that like you know you still watch it and you still can find these little makeup touches to certain characters that maybe you didn't see the first time and just be mm. completely blown away by it. So I have to cheat on that yeah. one and just say everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as well as those makeup effects, particularly Shuna Sassy. I would also tip a hat to the great matte paintings by Cliff Cully, yeah. a British mm. matte painter who 
had worked on things as far back as Dr. No in 1962 and had done Seven Bonds and also classics like Clash of the Titans. And he worked old fashioned style. There's no compositing there. He's hanging a sheet of glass in front of the camera and he's looking at the scene and he's painting around it and creating the Rockies and a winding road in the middle of the wilderness for a scene that's just shot, you know, some dirty road in London somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so to get the colour right and to compose a beautiful shot that still stands up pretty well today in 4K, that's something. That's a dying art. So it's a beautiful thing to look at. Mm. Favourite sound effect. Okay, so for the sound for me, there's one scene where Dicker and Sheath's uh, sort of like a barber's <laughs> cutthroat razor. And why yep. does it make a cat screeching sound? I know, that's exactly <laughs> oh what I've gosh. written down okay, as well. Yes. <laughs> it's odd. I know, Detective Joyce should really hear it. It is so loud. <laughs> and it's like <laughs> a cat where you've got a rocking chair on its tail or yeah, something. Yeah. It's just... Yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> it's an odd choice. <laughs> yeah, most funniest moment. I mean, I think it's anything with Narcisse. Like he's got so many great little one-liners in this movie that it's hard to pinpoint just one. Mm. Like, I, like I, I think especially like his sequence, like when uh, Boone is first meeting with Eilsberg and they're kind of talking, and I think that's when he says something like to the effect of like, "Oh, I've never touched a legend before," or something yeah. like that. And yeah, he's just got so many great one-liners in this movie so i think any time that he kind of comes in to add a little bit of levity uh, i think works mm -hmm. really really well i think that's where the real humor from this comes sure mm -hmm. yeah although the the woman with her weird gooey donut uh pastry thing is kind of like unintentionally <laughs> oh. funny to me yeah that scene <laughs> went on far too long and and just <laughs> <laughs> Not effective picking up of food from the floor. <laughs> and what is she trying to achieve? Just moving clumps of this this horrible concoction from the like floor there, to the like desk. A, a garbage can, right, or something? Like, why would you just not throw it directly into a garbage can? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it looks so vile as well. It's obviously been under the studio lights for far too long. It's yeah. sort of liquefied. Oh, it's horrible. Yeah, yeah. and she's like licking her fingers. Uh, at the same oh. time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's our move, please. Yes. Hey, this is Don Mancini, the creator of Chucky, and you are listening to Movie Oubliette. Okay, it's a final verdict. Should Clive Barker's Nightbreed be freed from Midian to scare the masses and be loved by all, or should it be swept into a collapsing tomb in the oubliette lost forever? Heather, you have uh, presented us with Nightbreed. What, what's your final take on this movie? Should people watch this movie? Oh, yes, I, th I think so. And I think what, what I love about Nightbreed is because I think it is a movie that's either when it came out was either ignored or misunderstood because of the way that it was presented then. So I feel like by having this new version um, that feels so much like what Clive had originally set out to create, it, it almost revitalizes it in a way um, that, I mean, I wasn't really expecting. Like I, I, I was going into the, seeing the director's cut for the first time. I just wanted to see what, Clive had always wanted to do and the way mm. that it moved me on an emotional level I just never expected that and I just I feel really grateful as a fan that we get this version now and I think there's much to learn and I think sadly there are some themes in this movie that are still unfortunately hugely relevant in our society today mm -hmm. so yeah I think it should be out there it should be celebrated as much as possible I love that people are still discovering it because i would say probably at least once a month i come across somebody on social media who's like oh i'm gonna you know i'm finally gonna watch this and because mm. i think here in the states like i think you can find nightbreed on like shutter amazon prime has it i think it might even be on tubi oh, wow. and i know for a long time it was even on like the voodoo free service here um so yeah i think the more people that get to see this and see the way that 
Clive had wanted to make it, I think is, is all for the better. But I do think also in retrospect, I think it is interesting to go back and watch the theatrical and sort of do that compare and contrast, because I think mm. to anybody who's interested in storytelling in horror and things like that, I think there's, there's some lessons that you can learn from both versions, I think. Yeah, sure. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. How about you, Dan? Yeah. Uh, so this movie, for me, I think it is, I think it is flawed. I think there are, there are parts of it that uh, I don't know really worked. Me personally, I didn't really like Boone as a character. I, I couldn't really connect mm. with him, but I connected way more with Laurie and with Narcisse and even with some of the uh, support cast were sort of more relatable. Uh, I think the, th the overall themes of this movie still resonate today. I think if you are a minority or into more of a sort of niche community or into something a bit left of center of, of normal society, I think this movie is definitely for you. Um, and of course you cannot go past the, the, the visual effects and the makeup and prosthetics in this movie, just incredible, incredible, and still hold up today. And if you want to see David Cronenberg being highly terrifying <laughs> <laughs> in one of the most villainous roles uh, ever in, in cinema, Nightbreed uh, is a must watch. So I, I would recommend this to people. Ah. Conrad. Okay. Yeah, I, I would agree I, with both of you. I think, oddly enough, I also think the theatrical cut is worth a watch. I think it, in many ways it it works a little better just as a polished film, finished film, than the director's cut because that was undermined by the resources that they had available to them. And I'm not sure that either fully, well, certainly not the theatrical cut, but even the director's cut, I'd, I'm not sure that it fully realises what Clive Barker was trying to achieve. I would kind of love to see him being given a bigger budget and maybe like a mini series on Netflix to really delve into the Midian world, because mm. as you say, it still resonates. There's something about horror generally that has always attracted minorities and, and people in the margins because they find more to relate to in the characters and to have characters here where the monsters are the heroes rather than you're just sort of relating to them but also feeling a bit bad because they're often evil or whatever. Mm. It is flawed. It's a curiosity. I don't think it's fully successful, but I don't think it should be ignored. I think it's it's a fascinating if you're, if you're interested in film, if you're interested in storytelling, if you're interested in Clive Barker and in the genre. I think it's it's a fascinating one to watch. I was never bored and I never hated it, but um, I just it just feels like something that didn't quite get to where it it really should have gotten to mm. had he been unfettered and supported throughout. But yeah, yeah. That's the way things are. Yeah. But I, I would say this movie was influential, though, because I, I think mm -hmm. of movies like um, Hellboy and, and like Penn's Labyrinth. Yeah. Like there's lots of similarities between uh, those movies and Nightbreed and even Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the TV show. Yes. It yeah. felt quite like the, they'd borrowed elements from Nightbreed. Yes, same production designer on Buffy. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for 12 episodes. Yeah. Uh, like uh, Boone's transformation, his look mm. is quite similar to the vampires in Buffy, I found. Mm. Yeah, you're quite right. Steve Hardy, production designer, worked on Hellraiser 3 and Lord of Illusions as well. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there you go. Yep, okay. So? So. Nightbreed. Let's set it free. <laughs> we are letting you go to let your freak flag fly. <laughs> well, Heather, it has been amazing having you with us again. Where mm. can our listeners follow you and hear more of your insights and read more of your insights into film? Well, thank you guys again for having me come back and getting to let my freak flag fly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can find me uh, over at dailydead.com. And I also sometimes am popping up over at fangoria.com as well. I actually just mm -hmm. recently did an article uh, looking at the special effects for Studio 666 with Tony Gardner. We just chatted about him oh, in Nightbreed. Oh, wow. 
Wow. Um, him and his team did the amazing effects work on Studio 666. And so we got to do some real fun behind the scenes, uh, look at some of the, the crazy stuff that they did on that movie. And then you can pretty much find me over uh, on Twitter at The Horror Chick. And currently Monsters Makeup and Effects Volume 1 is available to purchase um, pretty much anywhere you get books now. I I found out it was actually even like on Walmart and Target's websites of all places. So wow. uh, oh, I'm wow. moving up a little bit, <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is exciting. I was like, hey, look, I can order this from Target of all places. So yeah, yeah. yeah. so that's that's basically where I'm at these days. Yeah, and tantalizingly it says on the cover it's only volume one, so yes. there's more to come. Yes, there. it's going to be a four volume set, so volume Ooh. two wow. is uh, currently in the editing process and that should be out later this year and then we'll have three and four, so we've got over 80 stories uh, or 80 artists that we're going to be celebrating throughout this series, so it's very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're doing great and important work there. So, well, thank you. <laughs> People should check it out. <laughs> and if you want to follow us, you can find us on all our social media platforms uh, as Movie Oubliette, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and Reddit. And you can email us at movie.oubliette at gmail.com. We do love hearing from you. Yes, we do. And if you haven't already given us a rating and review, please do so on whatever platform you are using. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, um, give us some five-star loving. Oh, yeah. Love. (laughs) (laughs) Five-star loving. Oh, my. Um, And if you want to give us even more love, you can head on over to Patreon where you can support the show for as little as a dollar. You can be nominating... Uh, films for us to do in future episodes and getting access to extended parts of the show and for five dollars you'll get access to our exclusive video minisodes as well as extended special interviews with our special guests yes yes the minister we'll be releasing soon is going to be about the miniseries v yes so look forward to that back to the 80s my yeah. favorite place <laughs> <laughs> And lastly, we do have merchandise available on Redbubble. Everything you can ever imagine in your home is located there with our logo all over it. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Head on over there. So, Conrad, what are we going to be covering on our next episode? Well, we're doing a patron's pick for our 99th episode, so Dan better dust down and wheel on out that oubliette roulette. Oubliette roulette. This heavy thing again. All right. Give it a good spin. Okay, here we go. Ugh. It's Whoa. spinning. Spinning. Whoa. Oh, oh, it's landed on the rockety. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> I remember watching this in cinemas when I was a kid. Really? Yes. Wow. So yes, The Rocketeer. Yeah, 1991 American superhero film directed by Joe Johnston. So an ILM special effects man Mm -hmm. and starring Bill Campbell, Alan Arkin, Jennifer Connelly, Paul Uh Sorvino and Timothy Dalton. Ooh, yeah, I'm going to enjoy this. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. My favorite James Bond. Yeah. So, yeah. Released in 1991, budget of 40 million, box office of 46. Oh, dear. Mm, mm. So this was nominated by Seth Wilson. So thank you, Seth. Mm, Thanks, (laughs) Seth. Thanks, Seth. Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) So, yes, looking forward to that. Yes. All right. Thank you, listeners, uh, for joining us for another episode. And thanks again to Heather for joining us today. We'll catch you all next time. Bye, everybody. Thanks for listening. Bye for now. Goodbye. We review the films others tend to forget. Come with us and open up the movie you yet. Everything is true. God is an astronaut. Oz is over the rainbow. And Midian is where the monsters live.